Well, as the title indicates, I'm making another Gouda cheese. I know I have Gouda cheese videos out there already, but I'm doing several things in this video that I've never done making Gouda before, so I thought I would make another video. I'm going to be using this new mold that I just bought. It's a Dutch uh, Gouda mold called Kadova. K-A-D-O-V-A, I think. And the interesting thing about it is with this mold, you don't have to use any cheesecloth. You put your curd in this basket, which has a... Hmm, not quite sure what that is, but some kind of a synthetic, I think, screen. That goes down inside of the mold. And the follower that goes down after it uh, in the cheese press to, to put weight on it and press the whey out, it also has a lining of the same... Um, mesh on the top of it so it is like just like surrounding the whole thing with uh, with cheesecloth and, and pressing it that way only you don't have to keep unwrapping it and rewrapping it when you turn it over to, to press it some more not a cheap mold it costs quite a bit of money but I was fascinated by the the concept, I'd never heard tell of it before, I just happened to watch a, a video on, on YouTube uh, demonstrating it, so I had to rush out and see if I could find one. Uh, if you're in Canada, I got mine from Glengarry Cheese Supply Company in, in uh, Ontario, I think is where it's located. And the other thing I'm going to be doing is this uh, Gouda is going to have uh, herbs in it, fresh herbs out of my garden, which I'll be preparing here in a minute to show you the recommended process for curing the herbs before you use them and I'm using that uh, paint on artificial cheese covering not not a wax I've used it on a couple of cheeses with I think quite good success but I've never used it on a Gouda before and this is also as I say it's a Gouda mold so the cheese should come out of it shaped like a traditional Gouda I've been using an Edom mold in the past so Let's get started, and I, today I will be, this is day one, I will be just preparing the herbs. Tomorrow I will be working with the milk and starting to make the cheese. Well, I've been out in the garden, just selecting a variety of some fresh herbs that are available this time of year. This is an Asian chive, uh, larger than the ordinary chive. I like it very much, has a nice flavor. A bit of dill, some parsley a bit of French tarragon and a bit of sage. I'm going to mince these up and then they get, they've been washed, they're wet now, I just washed them. Won't make you watch me do all of this cutting. But once they have been cut, they go in the microwave for one minute on high. And that is to eliminate any bacteria or any other things that might have been, that might be on the surface of them so that you won't contaminate your cheese. So I will bring you back when I cut this ready to go in the microwave. Well there they are all minced up and now they'll go in the microwave for one minute on high. Well they sure smell good after they've been in the microwave for a minute. It didn't cook them up too bad. Actually it has started the dehydrating process which is next. They have to be dried. Let me get them all off this plate or not. And I'm going to put them in my dehydrator my wonderful technical <laughs> dehydrator. It has an off-on switch and that's the only settings that are available on it. I don't think it'll take very long in the dehydrator. An hour or two will probably do it. but I'll show you that in just a moment. Well, I folded the parchment paper up a bit sort of to make a, um, a ridge around all four sides, a little wall hoping that way the air circulation in this thing doesn't blow the herbs all over the place. I should also say that I don't have any idea how much this will create when it's dry. The recipe says to use one to two tablespoons to your taste. Uh, 
I think I'm going to go with one tablespoon. I don't want to overpower the flavor of the cheese. And if I think I need more next time I do this, I'll, I'll use more. But all I'm looking for is, is one tablespoon of a dehydrated mixed herbs here. Well, I think it was in for closer to three hours than two. I had to go out for a while. It is really crispy dry. Maintain a nice green color though. I'm not going to grind it into a powder or anything in the pestle and mortar. I just want to break up some of the bigger leaves, that's all. Just stamp on it a little bit. too much more than a tablespoon anyway. Things really shrink when you dehydrate them. Yeah, I would do it if that's much more than a full tablespoon, but I'll probably end up using all of it. Well, now I'm going to make the salt brine. I have a video showing that a long time ago. But I'll just do a few clips on it now. The last time that I made cheese a few weeks ago, I used the brine again. I'd been using it probably five, six times, and I decided that that was enough. I discarded that one, and I'll start with a fresh one today. I'm about to make the brine, but I have to tell you that this stuff also smells delicious. <laughs> I think I could use that in many more things other than cheese. In the stainless steel pot, I have one gallon of water. In my case, it's just ordinary tap water. I would suggest if you have city water, chlorinated, fluorinated, all that good stuff, that you buy a gallon of spring water or whatever to make it with. The chlorine and whatever would dissipate over time, but uh, I don't think it's anything I'd want to add to cheese when I'm brining it. In the one gallon of water I add two pounds of salt, and what I'm using is called a cheese salt. I buy it from the New England Cheese Company and they, they sell it as a cheese salt. But really all it is is just a fine grade pure salt. Uh, fine crystals, smaller crystals, so it, uh, it dissolves quicker. But no additives. It doesn't have any iodine or anything like that added. You wouldn't have to go to the bother of buying a cheese salt. Any pure salt, uh, straight sea salt that doesn't have any iodine added, or table salt that doesn't have iodine, kosher salt, pickling salt, uh, all of those salts don't have anything in them, so that would do. And to that you add one tablespoon of calcium chloride, a 30% solution, and that again is another thing that you buy from a cheese supply company, I buy mine from the New England Cheese Company, and one teaspoon of vinegar, and they're both in that. And I will heat this. Uh, it takes forever to dissolve the salt if you don't. But all I'll do is bring it to the boil or almost to the boil and keep stirring it until all of the salt has dissolved. And that's it. It's ready to use. As you can see, the salt is not, not melting quickly, but it will. It'll all go into solution here in a gallon of water. So I won't bother bringing you back for that process, but that's all you have to do to it. You could just keep stirring it cold and eventually it will all, all dissolve, but it works much faster if you heat it. Well, I'm just getting started. This is day two on the process of actually making the cheese. I have my, I guess it's a five gallon container of uh, milk. It's only got four gallons in it, 16 quarts, U.S. quarts, so that's about 15 and a half liters in the hot water bath here, a tepid hot water bath, gradually bringing the temperature up to 85 degrees, and I've still got more than 20 degrees to go here. The milk came out of the refrigerator. It was way down the low 40s, the temperature of it. These are in Fahrenheit temperatures, of course, here. I'm using an American recipe. 
Uh, I'm using two recipes, which I'll give you a little hint here in a few seconds as to what I'm talking about, but I've got probably half, three quarters of an hour to go yet before this warms up to the target temperature of 85 degrees. I'm sort of combining two recipes, so to put a link down below to the recipe is not really possible, I guess. I'm using mostly this book again. Uh, I used it on my last cheese. I think it turned out all right. It's still aging. My main problem with the book is it is so vague on the weight that you would press this. It uses terms like light, medium, heavy. And what does that mean? I haven't a clue. So I have also printed the recipe from cheesemaking.com and that's the one that I have used in the past. And there are some striking differences. Uh, as I go along, I'll mention them, I guess, but right now I'll just tell you there are some, some differences. The target temperature is only different by one degree. Uh, Ricky Carroll at, uh, at uh, cheesemaking.com says 86 degrees, and this book says 85, so you know, one degree is not a big difference. Uh, but there is a difference in the amount of time that it's pressed and, and many other things as we go along. And I'm going to stick mostly to this book, I think. I sort of like the way the the recipe is planned out in here, and I'm also doing the herbs in it, which is not in 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 this particular one. So enough explanation over why there isn't a link down below. I'll bring you back when the milk gets up to target temperature. Well, the milk has reached the target temperature of 85 degrees, or about 85 and a half, I guess. And where the two recipes do agree is that it is one te half teaspoon of mesophilic culture that you add. And let that hydrate on the surface for five minutes before I mix it in. And here's another point where they differ. Uh, the book, after you mix it in, just moves right on to adding calcium chloride and uh, rennet and uh, Ricky Carroll's recipe online uh, says to let it uh, ripen for 30 minutes which is what I'm going to do um, I don't know how much of a difference that makes but I've never made a cheese where you didn't let the culture ripen for a while before you put the rennet in so I will let that sit there for five minutes I will stir it in thoroughly and let it ripen for 30 minutes and I'll bring you back at that time. Well, it's had its 30 minutes to ripen and now I'm going to add three quarters of a teaspoon of calcium chloride diluted in a quarter cup of water and thoroughly mix that in. If you're using raw milk you don't have to add the calcium chloride but you add it if you're using pasteurized milk and this is just store-bought pasteurized milk and here is where the two recipes disagree again Ricky Carroll's online recipe calls for two teaspoons of rennet and the recipe in this book calls for three quarters of a teaspoon so I've gone somewhere in the middle I guess I've used one teaspoon of rennet and again diluted in a quarter cup of water And I'm going to let that set until we have a firm coagulation, clean break they call it. Um, probably close to three quarters of an hour for this volume of milk. And I'm remembering to take the ladle out. I just checked the temperature and um, it uh, went up to 86 degrees uh, while it was ripening in this hot water, well, warm water bath. So that's good. The, the uh, two temperatures anyway, one was 85 and one was 86. So it's now at 86. I'll let that set for at least a half hour then I'll test it, but I suspect it'll go for at least 45 minutes. 
It's had 30 minutes. I'll test for what we call a clean break. Yeah, I would say that is a clean break. So I will now cut the curd. And once again, I won't make you stand by and watch me do all of this. Half inch, I think, is what we're going for here. Half inch. pieces of curd. If you haven't watched before I'll stop now and explain. I will go this way the whole way across then I'll turn and go this way and I'll bring you back at that point because that's when I I take a whisk and do the curds that are down below. Well, everything has been cut in both directions at roughly half inch intervals and now I use as you've seen before if you watched any of my cheese videos lately I find this method of using a wire whisk to cut the curd down below the surface works really well I just keep going until I reach the bottom I, every Every complete revolution, I sink it down a little further. There's really quite a bit of resistance. It's a very firm curd at this point. And I'm on the bottom. I checked and it is still at the target temperature and I don't think I've mentioned yet in this video that all of the equipment has been sanitized everything that I'm using uh, you can do it in many methods boiling it in hot water I think is probably the most common but I use a dairy sanitizer professional cold water sanitizer that's used in uh, commercial dairies. I buy it from the cheese making supply company in a much smaller quantity than commercial dairies would buy it in. But uh, you put two ounces of it in five gallons of water. I use the same thing with five gallons of cold water. And you just dip everything that you're going to use and let it air dry. And it is then sanitized. So at this point, I start my timer. And this is allowed to settle. For five minutes. I'll bring you back at five minutes time. It's had its five minutes rest and now you gently stir for five minutes. Start the timer again. After this five minutes of stirring you let it settle again for five minutes and hopefully at that time all of the curd will sink to the bottom. If not, you stir again for five more minutes. I have another stainless steel stock pot on a burner next to this that I'm about to turn on because I need 140 degree water for the phase that follows this stirring and settling. So. I'll bring you back after I have stirred for five minutes and it has settled for five minutes and we'll see where we're at. Well the curd all settled to the bottom so I don't have to do any more stirring. And now I remove six cups of the whey. Approximately six cups of the whey.
Now the 140 degree water is all ready. And I add enough of that in to bring the temperature up to 92 degrees. I'll double check, but I'm quite sure that's what it said. I have to have my thermometer ready and gently stir and add enough of the 140 degree water to get it up to 92 or 93 degrees. I'll bring you back when I've accomplished that. Well, it has reached 92 degrees and now I gently stir for 10 minutes. I'll bring you back in 10 minutes time. Well I have gently stirred for 10 minutes 92 degree whey and now you remove roughly a third of the whey down to the level of the curd anyway without throwing away any of the curd, hopefully. There are many uses, of course, for the whey, but this has been diluted and it's going to be diluted even further, so I don't think you would be able to successfully um, make anything like ricotta or whatever with it, so it is being discarded. down to the curd there. Now i got to be more careful, I guess. It won't take out very much more. I think that's about it. Add back an equal amount to what you took out of uh, 110 degree water. And you stir for 20 minutes trying to checking my notes. Trying to get the uh, curds and whey up to a temperature of 98 degrees Fahrenheit. All of these temperatures that I've been given are in giving are in, nine, in Fahrenheit. Well, right now I have that at 97. 97 and a half, so that's pretty close. And in the hot water bath here I should be able to maintain it at around 98 degrees. Stirring constantly for 20 minutes. Bring you back at that point. Well, I have been stirring continually for 20 minutes. And I must say, using two recipes can give you a better feeling of confidence. The book insists on 98 degrees, maintaining 98. I took the temperature and realized that mine had got up to 101. I referred to Ricky Carroll's recipe, and she says 98 to 102. So... Makes me feel better, anyway. I'm removing enough whey now to cover cover the house, I guess, to cover the uh, mold, the Cadova mold, which I also have the screen in, the thing that replaces muslin or cheesecloth. The purpose of doing this is to warm up the mold. be able to 
completely cover it, but... It doesn't really matter if I get a little bit of the curd, because it's going right into the mold anyway. Well, I'll bring you back at the next phase, which is adding the uh, herbs that I prepared yesterday. Okay, that's a clean stainless steel colander lined with butter muslin so that the curd won't go down the sink. As Julia Child would say, with my impeccably clean hands, I'm going to mix in that herb mixture. Try to get it somewhat evenly distributed throughout the curd. The aroma is coming off of it immediately with the herbs. done I guess. And now I will bring over the uh, mold and try to fill it. I removed part of the way but left some of it in the mold. This is a mold that is supposed to make a 1.5 to 2 kilogram Gouda. much milk you should get four pounds which is you should get roughly four pounds I guess so, two kilograms is four point four pounds Hopefully I will get a decently shaped Gouda cheese out of this with the first time I've used a real Gouda mold. And I must say I like the concept of not having to work with this butter muslin inside the mold. I guess that's everything. Now I'll get the follower on. put this in the cheese press, bring you back when it's in the press. In the mold and under light pressure, uh, which of course what I don't like about this book, it doesn't tell you what light pressure might be. Uh, Ricky Carroll in her recipe says six pounds of pressure for 15 minutes just to consolidate the, uh, the curd and then you start flipping it, turning it over and, and uh, increasing the pressure a bit. So I started with 10 and it's down now I would say below 5 but you constantly have to adjust with this kind of a cheese press. 
because as it expels the whey, the uh, spring tension is lost. Anyway, I'll bring you back at 15 minutes when hopefully I'll make one successful flip of this cheese. Okay, still doing the first press here. Uh, and I've <laughs> going back and forth between the two recipes, I've confused them. Ricky Carroll does that first six pound pressing under the brine, under the whey, um, thin dough whey there that it was in at last. She does, uh, puts a jug of milk or something on top of it for the six pound weight. And I didn't do that, I removed it immediately, which is more what the book is talking about. So after the 15 minutes at six pounds, uh, Ricky did not reform the cheese. She just brings it out, puts it in the cheese press, and increases the press pressure up to nine or ten pounds, and presses for 30 minutes before you flip it the first time. So I'm just waiting for this 15 minutes to pass, then I'll increase the pressure, and I won't take it out to flip the uh, cheese over until it's had 30 minutes at uh, nine or ten pounds. And it's 30 minutes at 9 to 10 pounds. And now for the first time, <laughs> I can get the faller right up there. It comes out and gets flipped over. Sideways again. I must say I like this idea very much. And as you can see, the herbs seem to be fairly evenly distributed. Put the follower back. Oops. And I'll be back in a few minutes after I get it in the press back in the press and the press is assembled and now it gets pressed for 30 minutes at roughly 16 pounds 16 to 18 somewhere in there and I've added this little block of extender I don't think it's going to be necessary but rather than safe than sorry I'll add a little more to the top of the follower so that it, if it ever should get down to the top of the, of the mold here it will still be able to apply the pressure, I guess is what I'm trying to say. I'll bring you back in 30 minutes time. Just finished its 30 minutes at 16 to 18 pounds of pressure. And now it gets flipped again. And this time it goes under 25 pounds of pressure for 30 minutes. So it's coming together quite nicely. Much firmer now. Don't worry so much about it falling apart. Ready to go back in the press. In the press under 25 pounds pressure for 30 minutes and then it comes out and is flipped for the last time and goes back in the press at uh, 25 pounds pressure for six to eight hours. So I will show you in the next phase when I take it out for the final flipping. Ready for its final flip. I like the shape. Much more traditional 
Gouda. I like the way it got the herbs distributed. Well, it goes back in the press. I won't bother to show you that again. At 25 pounds pressure for six to eight hours, and I think I'm going to go with eight hours to completely consolidate the, the cheese. So I'll bring you back in eight hours' time. Well, it's had its eight hours, and now it gets brined. if I can get it out of there. There we go. There we go. Yes. And this is that salt brine solution that I made. And it really evened out nicely. There were some cavities and holes that I was worried about before it went in this final pressing. But a nice even distribution of the uh, herbs as well. Brine for 12 hours. Uh, six hours into the brining I'll flip it over so that it gets brined evenly because it's floating the top part here is not under the salt solution at all. So I'll bring you back 12 hours from now, I guess. I have been attempting to fine-tune the temperature in my cheese cave, my cheese refrigerator. Uh, I have a thermometer in there. I've just never thought it was very reliable. And it's so difficult to tell what range you have the temperature in. And all of a sudden I had a thought. <laughs> I went outside and got the remote sensor for this uh, weather station thing here in my living room. And you can have it do either Fahrenheit or, or uh, Celsius. So I switched it over to Fahrenheit and I put the sensor inside of the refrigerator about 24 hours ago. And the temperature that uh, I'm after, the target temperature for uh, the Gouda cheese according to the book that I'm following uh, is 10 degrees cooler than what Rick and Carol uses, but it says 50 to 54, and I already have a Pepper Jack, Monterey Jack cheese in, and that's about the same temperature that it requires. Anyway, I turned, kept turning on the uh, th remote thermostat until I, I, this is what it's come down to over 24 hours now. Uh, the lowest temperature, I press the button here on the back, the lowest temperature is 50, which is what I'm after, and then before it kicks back in and, and cools it down again, the highest that it has gone is 54, so I'm really impressed with that. And this is what the outside of the environment is like today, exactly. It is raining and kind of windy. I've just finished brining and I have brought it out. This is the setup. It'll be moving probably into my dining room shortly, but that's just a metal cake rack and then a cheese, a reed cheese mat on top of that so that the cheese doesn't actually ever touch the metal. But with this way you get air circulation around. And now it will dry for at least three days until it is, you know, completely dry. I'll cover it over with a light uh, just lightly on top of it, a bit of butter muslin cheesecloth, just so dust and flies and whatever don't get on it, and turn it once a day until it is completely dry. And the process varies again here from what Ricky Carroll recommends to what this book recommends. I have never uh, aged it um, before waxing it, and the book recommends to put it in a container. Uh, which I, I'll show you when I when I do that. 
um, same container that I've used for other cheeses and to store it at the ripening temperature of 50 to 54. The drying part of it is done at room temperature but to store it unwaxed uh, for a week and then to wax it. So I'm not quite sure what the advantage is there but I'm going to try it. So I will bring you back in three or four days time when this is completely dry. Well, the cheese has dried for three days and it is very dry to the touch. Uh, it also, at least the surface of it, has turned a nice creamy yellow color, which I like. And this is where the two recipes uh, <laughs> diverge again, I guess. The book uh, says to now put it in a ripening box at 50 to 54 degrees, which I've got the uh, cheese fridge adjusted to, and uh, to ripen it for a week. Uh, at 85% humidity. Well, I've, I've gone and got my outdoor sensor again because it also uh, senses the amount of humidity. So I will check to make sure that this is going to be up somewhere around 85% humidity. And I'll check it daily. I think I'll probably still turn it daily. It doesn't say to do that. But my concern is at high humidity that uh, mold of some sort might start to grow on the surface. and. In a week's time it wouldn't really get away from you, but I will uh, remove any mold that that uh, starts to form with a, a damp cloth dipped in a salt water solution. And which means if I have to do that, I guess it'd probably have to come out for a few hours to dry again before I wax it at the end of the week's time. But anyway, it is now ready to go in the cheese fridge for a week, and I will check to make sure that it's at 85% humidity. I guess what I didn't say is if, if by some reason it doesn't get up to 85 degrees, 85 percent rather, humidity, I will probably put a damp uh, paper towel or something in one corner in there just to increase the humidity. Well, it's been in the cheese fridge for, I don't know, over three hours, I think. And this is the humidity inside there. It's 84 percent, so I'm satisfied with that. 1% doesn't make any great difference, I don't think. If it should drop, I'll do something about it. Or if it should continue to rise and went higher, then I would open the top of the container up a bit to let some of the humidity out. But I would say 84 is close enough to perfection. Well, the cheese has had its week of ripening without a coating. And now I'm going to paint on the she is coating here. It's not a wax, it's a coating. And the last time I used it on my Monterey Jack, it uh, took quite a while to dry. It may this time as well. But I just noticed part of the label on the cover is missing. And it says to prior to using, and whatever was before prior to using isn't there. I suspect it probably said to uh, mix it up well prior to using. So that's what I've done this time anyway. And if you haven't watched me do this before, I've only done it once or twice before I guess, um, this coating has to go on in two layers and it has to completely dry in between. So It takes time even if it dries rapidly I guess. But I will bring you back, maybe to show some of the second one, second coat going on, or the finished product, one or the other. That is still the first side, the first coat that I've put on, but I had an idea, a thought actually occurred. It's very warm and humid here this time of year and going to be even worse I guess by the weekend. We're under a heat advisory for the weekend. Um, I brought a large fan out. One of those pedestal fans. You can see the air if you can't hear the fan. The air is blowing that paper towel out straight. And that worked very well. It uh, normally would take quite a while for it to dry on one side and that is completely dry. So. I will flip it, do the other side, and I'll bring you back and show you the finished product after it's had its second coat. Well, there's the finished product ready for aging. 
and the recipe in the book says anywhere from two months, 60 days, to longer period of time if you want a stronger cheese, I guess. I'm going to age this for the 60 days, two months, middle of August. It will be ready to try. And I must say, I'm glad I thought of the fan. That cut the time down to a fraction of what it was the last time that I used this stuff. Just the air blowing over it dried it out so much quicker. And I have just weighed it. It weighs three pounds, six ounces, and a bit. I'm sort of a fraction of an ounce. Three pounds, six ounces, anyway. The target weight, according to the recipe, would be four pounds. So I'm a bit underweight. Many things could have caused that, I guess. Pressing it too high a weight or cooking it for too long a period or whatever. But anyway, that's what I've got. I'm really looking forward to trying this one to see if I like the herbed Gouda. Well, thank you very much for watching.